Todd, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Happy Earth Day. I am Todd David, the Executive Director of the Housing Action Coalition. Housing Action Coalition is a 23-year-old member-based organization. Uh, we educate and advocate for multi-family multi housing at all levels of affordability. That is uh, well-located. When we say well-located, we're talking about urban centers, near jobs, near job centers, and near transit hubs. Um, and uh, I think it, uh, today on Earth Day, it's particularly uh, important to talk about the environmental imperative of multifamily housing uh, near, you know, multifamily housing in urban centers, uh, near job centers, and near transit hubs. Um, you know, in California, the number one, the number one um, contributor to greenhouse gases is uh, auto exhaust and auto, you know, so super commutes and things like that are really contributing to our greenhouse gases in California. And in addition to making sure that we build multifamily housing in a really environmentally friendly locations, we also need to do a better job of the materials that we use to build that multifamily housing, right? These things go hand in hand together. And so we're really excited to talk about this issue today on the home and environment. And I want to uh, particularly thank Woodworks for sponsoring uh, the event. Um, you know, Woodworks is the Wood Products Council. Uh, they are uh, perhaps the leading voice for cross-laminated timber, which is an innovative product. That's something that the Housing Action Coalition has certainly been supportive of um, for the last number of years. And so we're excited to hear from the panel, uh, perhaps learn a little bit more about cross-laminated timber and to just talk about the uh, intersection of environmentalism and housing. So with that, Kayla, I'm gonna mm -hmm. turn it right back over to you. Awesome, thanks, Todd. Um, so as an FYI, this home and environment conversation is the first of what we hope will be mini conversations of our home and series, which is designed to raise public awareness around the interconnection of housing and other critical issues such as health, transportation, and of course the environment. And I'm really, really excited to introduce our panelists. Um, we are being joined by Chelsea Drenick, Regional Director of Woodworks, Robin Landis, Senior Project Manager at DCI Engineers, and Katie Ackerley, Principal at David Baker Architects. So with that, I will turn it over to Chelsea for a few opening remarks. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, I really admire the ongoing work that you and the Housing Action Coalition are doing. Uh, really thank you for having me here today. I'm excited about this panel and conversation. So before getting into the content of the presentation, I just wanna say a few quick words about Woodworks for those who may not know about us. What does Woodworks do? Well, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping project teams design and construct wood buildings. We provide free wood design assistance to architects, engineers, uh, and others in the building industry. Uh, you can stay back one slide. Uh, our team includes individuals across the country with expertise in all aspects of wood design and engineering. Uh, architects and engineers who can help with everything from seismic design and fire protection to code issues or value engineering. Our support extends to all types of commercial and multifamily wood buildings. And we're here to help from design through construction at no cost to you whatsoever. So bring us your challenges. We're here to help remove barriers in wood design. Next slide. Um, so as uh, Kaylee said, I'm Chelsea Drenick, uh, Regional Director for Woodworks for Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. Uh, a bit about me, I joined Woodwork seven months ago uh, after nine years in structural design consulting here in the Bay Area. Uh, and one of the reasons I joined Woodworks is because I'm very interested in sustainability in the built environment and how the use of wood as a building material can reduce embodied carbon emissions of structures. Uh, there are regional directors all over the country and we provide free project assistance based on where you, the professional, is located. So uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Uh, we're here to help. Next slide. So we can provide free project assistance because of our funding partners. So a special thank you to the Softwood Lumber Board, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the Forestry Innovation Investment. Next. Uh, we also have a number of funding partners that are manufacturers, and I'd like to thank them for their support as well. All right, next. So let's jump into the content of our presentation today. We're talking about home and the environment. Why? Well, in 2019, we were at a global population of 7.7 .7 billion. 
This is expected to rise to 11.2 in 2050. Where do we house everyone? Where will they work? How will climate change impact where people can live and work? Next. So we need more buildings, we need more housing, but buildings generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. So that 40% is made up of two things shown here in yellow, building operations and building materials and construction, also referred to as embodied energy. So building operational emissions are the emissions from heating and cooling our homes, using electricity, turning on the lights. Embodied energy emissions is the carbon emissions from materials and construction of the building, this upfront energy used to build a building. Earlier this week, it was announced that President Biden will announce today on Earth Day that the United States intends to cut greenhouse gas emissions nearly in half by the end of the decade, by 2030, a target that will require Americans to transform the way we drive, heat our homes, manufacture goods, and it requires us in the building industry to take on this challenge of reducing carbon emissions of the built environment. Next slide. So looking at this embodied carbon and operational carbon a little more closely, you know, our operational carbon here is a bigger portion of building emissions. It's about 75%, but embodied carbon is this upfront cost. It takes 17 years for operational carbons to surpass embodied carbons. So we can have a real impact by reducing them in the short term. And I think the building industry is focused for a long time on operational carbons, uh, which is great, but now we're looking at embodied carbons more and more. How can we reduce them? You know, operational energy emissions, this operational carbon is only improving with greener grids, more efficient heating and cooling. Um, embodied energy, this embodied carbon is not insignificant and it doesn't have to be a necessary evil of a new building being built. So I know Robin and Katie will be going into details of this as well, opportunities for reducing operational embodied carbons. Um, but as the Woodworks representative here, I wanted to talk a bit about wood. Um, so one thing that can help us reduce this embodied carbon emissions uh, is wood. Wood is 49% carbon by mass. In other words, for about 50% of this wood is carbon. Carbon that was in our atmosphere contributing to global warming is now physically converted into a solid form of wood and put into the building. Whole building life cycle assessments typically show wood as a way to reduce the embodied carbon footprint of a building. Oh, can you go back? One more. All right, so let's visit the wood carbon cycle briefly. Uh, life cycle of wood begins with the growth of trees in a forest. So carbon flows in a forest ecosystem as the trees grow. Uh, this is assuming wood comes from a forest which is sustainably managed. Uh, which is true here in the US, uh, and I'll talk about that more on the next slide, uh, the forest carbon stock remains very stable. So carbon is stored in a tree for the life of that tree. Left to natural processes, the tree will die and decay, releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. Instead, carbon can continue to be stored by using that solid material in buildings and building products. When wood is used as a substitute for materials with significant industrial process emissions, uh, such as cement-based materials, the emissions benefits can be significant. Next slide. So throughout the life of a wood building, it's storing, basically acting as a carbon sink, storing that carbon dioxide. However, one thing to note, it's only sustainable if the forest is sustainable, if the forest remains a forest after the tree is harvested. A common misconception is that growth in demand for forest products has a negative impact on forest resources. In the US, this just isn't accurate. Over the last 100 years, the US forests have been very stable. There are also there are sustainable forestry practices in place across the US and Canada, and there's sustainable certifications available as well if that's important for your project, say for lead points. Studies have shown use of forest for wood products actually increases trees in a forest. Next. So I wanna introduce an innovation in the wood industry, a new type of wood product called mass timber. What is mass timber? Mass timber uses smaller pieces of lumber to build up larger members and panels. The wood pieces are laminated together either using adhesives, nails, screws, or another type of mechanical fastening. So here's a visual comparison that I like, I like a lot. Heavy timber on the left, mass timber on the right. So heavy timber is a historic type of construction using solid pieces of wood. Maybe you've seen this in an old building. One of the old adages was large column, large tree. 
meaning that every single large cross section of wood had to come from a single tree, which can be hard to source. So if you had to have a 12 by 12 column, you have to have a tree that's large enough to find that. Whereas on the right with mass timber, you can still have that column. But instead of coming from one singular log, we can fabricate them from smaller pieces. So we can use standard lumber products, maybe even lower grade products using smaller diameter trees to still produce these larger sized elements, columns, beams, and panels. Next. So here's a few product examples. Uh, there's a lot out there on the market. Uh, so this is just a intro slide here. Uh, glue laminated timber on the left known for short as glue lamb, uh, typically makes up the beams and columns of a mass timber building. In the center, cross laminated timber, CLT, uh, large panels made up of smaller wood members that are glued together with adhesive to form floors and walls. Each lamination alternates directions, so it's very dimensionally stable and has strength in two directions. Nail laminated timber top right, also known as NLT, the laminations all run in one direction, so they're nailed to each other. Uh, so it's all in one direction, so only strength in one direction. Next. While we're talking about mass timber, I wanted to share with you the Woodworks Innovation Network. On the site, we are showcasing innovative wood projects and their project teams. Check out our interactive map to take a look at these exciting new buildings. We are also tracking projects we know about in design and construction out of mass timber, which is over a thousand buildings since we started tracking in 2013. In 2015, in six years ago, we were assisting on a handful of mass timber projects. Last year, we helped on over 250. So this exponential growth is really exciting. Mass timber is really here. Next. So several tech companies are building their corporate offices with mass timber and investing in mass timber projects all around the Bay Area. Uh, local examples are Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. So there's a lot of exciting projects uh, in the works around the Bay Area. Next. And the future of wood is going taller. July 1st this year, code provisions will go into effect allowing up to 18 stories of mass timber here in California. So California is adopting these tall wood provisions early. And one of the big proponents of the tall wood provisions is Chief Mike Richwine, the state fire marshal. He says early adoption of tall mass timber can benefit California in three main ways. It'll increase market demand for mass timber production here in California, increasing jobs. It'll increase the pace and scale of wildfire prevention by thinning the forest of small diameter trees that could be used for mass timber. I mentioned that earlier, mass timber is made up of smaller components. So we can use these smaller diameter trees that'll thin our forests. And his third point here, mass timber construction can help us reduce our carbon footprint reducing carbon emissions of the built environment. All right, next slide. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, Chelsea, appreciate that. Um, and as a structural engineer of the group, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the embodied carbon portion of our built environment. So as Chelsea, as Chelsea mentioned previously, nearly 40% of global CO2 emissions come from the building industry. 28% from building operations and 11% from building materials and construction. There's a huge opportunity for us as building designers to improve the way buildings are built and continue, continue and contribute to the solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing operational carbon cannot be the only solution. It must go hand in hand with reducing embodied carbon. Operational energy can be reduced over time with energy efficiency renovations and the use of renewable energy, but embodied carbon is locked into the atmosphere as soon as the building is built, so we should start making changes as quickly as possible. Next slide. Some big organizations in the AEC industry are creating framework and facilitating resources to help meet sustainability goals. The AIA 2030 challenge was established in 2006 to reduce operational energy associated with new and existing construction. The challenge required that operational energy stay 70% below the regional average for that building type and then incrementally increase its reduction to 100% by 2030. In 2009, the AIA created the 2030 commitment to support the challenge by committing signatory firms to this goal and is facilitating data reporting to measure progress. In 2019, the Carbon Leadership Forum proposed the SE 2050 challenge. Modeled similarly after the 2030 challenge, this aims to eliminate the impact of embodied carbon when considering all stages of the building's life cycle by the year 2050. 
Similar to what the AIA did with the 2030 challenge, the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Structural Engineering Institute developed a commitment program to provide a clear pathway to achieve this goal. Next slide. Now we're gonna talk about a couple different common building materials and what the impacts are with their embodied carbon. So first is steel. And steel is the most recycled material in the world. About 93% of all structural steel in the United States specifically is recycled. While other products can only be downcycled, steel products can be recycled over and over again, remade into new members without any loss of quality. Because steel is so commonly recycled, the factor controlling its embodied carbon footprint is the energy grid tied to the manufacturer. The less fossil fuels required to recycle the steel, the lower the embodied carbon footprint. Structural steel manufacturers are turning to increasingly more clean energy sources, such as wind and solar electricity, to power their facilities. Another benefit of steel production is that we can use the manufacturing byproducts in many other applications. For example, slag can be used in concrete production or as fertilizer for crops, and the gases produced from processing steel can be used as engine fuel for power generation. The biggest new innovation in the steel industry is electric arc furnace. This process uses an electrical current to produce molten steel instead of utilizing fossil fuels associated with traditional methods. This process greatly reduces embodied carbon associated with steel production and is becoming increasingly more common in the industry. Next slide. Concrete has a large carbon footprint because of the high energy processes required to make Portland cement binder. In fact, if cement were a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter in the world, just behind China and the United States. The main strategy for concrete design is to reduce the amount of cement required in concrete to maximize embodied carbon savings. In concrete, recycled byproducts such as slag and fly ash are commonly used to substitute some of the cement required in the mixture and can significantly reduce the associated body embodied carbon. Another innovative material on the market that is getting a lot of attention is Portland limestone cement. This product has a lower environmental impact because limestone can be substituted for other raw materials in the cement making process, and it requires less energy to grind than traditional methods, resulting in lower greenhouse gas emissions. When considering the supplemental cementitious materials in special blended cements, it is important to make sure that the concrete supplier, structural engineer, and the contractor are all involved to ensure the intended performance criteria is achieved because these products affect the harden and soften properties of the concrete. Concrete specifications really need to be tailored so the supplier has freedom to create efficient concrete mixtures that meet these performance recommend requirements instead of using traditional prescriptive specifications. Because of its high embodied carbon content, the concrete industry is starting to face increasingly more stringent reg regulations to reduce its CO2 emissions. Next slide. Wood is the only truly renewable resource that we build with. We've talked about the recycling capability of steel and concrete, but there is still only a finite amount of those materials in the world. Mm -hmm. Trees can be replanted and regrown, and as they do, they naturally sequester carbon throughout their lifetime by storing CO2 from the air in their mass roots and surrounding soils. Once the trees are cut down to be used for building materials, that carbon is locked into place which makes wood an incredibly effective, sustainable material, and not to mention completely renewable. Wood can only be as sustainable as the process used to harvest and manufacture the product. To minimize the amount of embodied carbon associated with wood construction, it's incredibly important to use materials sourced from climate smart forests. Another consideration when choosing wood suppliers is to look for locally harvested and manufactured products. In actuality, when trees are harvested, about half of the weight is water content. So this greatly contributes to transportation emissions immediately following the harvesting of the trees. Next slide. So the question is, how do we get there? How do we achieve net zero embodied carbon? First and foremost, it's important to get the entire design team, especially the structural engineer, involved early on. 
Buildings often take shape before many players get involved during schematic design, but the team should be working together early in the project to ensure the impacts of building form and structural materials are considered in the project decisions. It is equally important to communicate sustainability goals with contractors as soon as possible to ensure the intended materials and methods are available and considered in the project schedule and budget. We can also take advantage of free resources that are available online to help, consider, to help consider embodied carbon as a factor in design decisions. A couple of these free tools are Carbon Smart and EC3, which both have extensive libraries of materials to help evaluate the sustainability of materials being specified on a project. The biggest thing we can do though are life cycle, life cycle assessments. LCAs study the environmental impact of constructing a building throughout its entire life from resource extraction through demolition and possibly beyond. At each stage in the life of building products, the LCA analyzes how emissions and pollutants are produced. The more of these studies we do, the more data we will have on greenhouse gas sources, the better we will be able to target those sources and eliminate the emissions. Next slide. So to summarize, concrete is the largest culprit of embodied carbon, which can be seen in the pie chart on the right. Even though the majority of the concrete construction is commercial, shown as the darker yellow region, there is still a large contribution to CO2 emissions from residential concrete construction, shown in that middle shade of yellow. If we're able to utilize alternative renewable materials in place of the concrete, or substitute greener, more sustainable concrete mixes, we'll, we will be able to target the second largest piece of the CO2 emissions pie. Next slide. So one of those renewable resources, as Chelsea mentioned, that could be used in place of concrete is mass timber. Chelsea introduced a couple of the mass timber products earlier, the most widely known and talked about currently being cross laminated timber. This product is able to compete with concrete due to its two-way span capability and could be utilized on residential projects that were previously intended to be concrete. Next slide. With the upcoming inclusion in the 2021 IBC, mass timber will continue to become more and more prevalent. The 2021 IBC provisions for mass timber construction have already been pre-adopted in Oregon, Washington, Utah, Virginia, the city of Denver, California, and as of just last week, Idaho. By July of this year, every jurisdiction in California will have these mass timber construction classifications included as part of their local codes. So the need for peer reviews or alternative methods and materials reviews will no longer be needed for tall mass timber buildings, thus making mass timber construction easier and more viable than ever. Next slide. The appeal for mass timber is substantial for many reasons. It's entirely prefabricated. The panels are manufactured, cut, stored, stacked, and shipped all from the shop. The panels are also incredibly precise, essentially eliminating construction tolerances. This precision is, is achieved through computer numerically controlled machines that are used to cut the panels as well as any and all penetrations through them. This significantly minimizes construction time and increases safety in the field. Once the trucks arrive on site, the panels are picked one by one and slid seamlessly into place. Another benefit of the prefabrication of mass timber is that it results in very small amounts of material waste. The picture here in the bottom is showing what we might expect at the end of the day for waste at a construction site using mass timber. We're no longer delivering a pallet of two by 12s to the site and cutting off potentially six, 12, 18 inches off each member which turns into waste. With a mass timber construction site, it's all prefabricated, all very precise and accurate, so we have virtually no waste at the end of the construction project due to, due to its prefabricated nature. To further demonstrate just how clean a mass timber construction site is, here are a few images from the active construction site of Fermondaharo. As you can see, there is no debris, no waste, not even extra screws or nails laying around. By prefabricating the mass timber, coordinating it ahead of time and planning it all out, we're able to maximize the material utilization and essentially eliminate waste altogether. Here are a few other images during the mass timber installation at Wandaharo. 
The panels were arranged in such a way that as the trucks pulled up, the crane picked off the top panel and put it in its correct location and made its way down the stack until the now empty truck pulled away and the next truck took its place. They were able to set an entire floor of panels and the next level of column, columns and beams in just under two weeks. Just a few more images from Wandaharo showing the crane lifting the, plan up the panels into place and how they fit right into place with no issues, even around column openings and various unique geometries. One other sustainable aspect related to wood construction that isn't related to greenhouse gases is biophilia. This is that warm, welcoming, cozy feeling you get by being surrounded by a wood environment. This, feel, this feeling has actual health benefits too. Students have shown to have better test scores and hospital patients have shown to recover quicker when being surrounded by a wood aesthetic. So these benefits are truly quantifiable. They aren't just a random feeling. You can see in the graphic on the right how much of the mass timber can be left exposed in the new type four construction classifications. With type four B and C, most, if not all, of the mass timber can be left exposed, taking full advantage of the biophilic benefits. With type 4A, the mass timber must be completely concealed, but you're still able to take advantage of all the other benefits that come with using mass timber. Great. Thank you, Robin. On to Katie. Thank you, and thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, we're big fans of Hack, and uh, yeah, it's just really great to see these case studies and be able to add to that. Um, you can advance the slides. We are, if you're not familiar with us, an architecture firm that um, is about almost 40 years old, actually, based in San Francisco. We also have offices in Oakland and Birmingham, Alabama, with a national practice now. Um, and our practice really focuses on um, issues of provide of housing, but <laughs> we are pretty much exclusively multifamily housing design experts. Um, but we really uh, focus our practice on creating homes and mixed use communities that uh, work for people. Um, you can go forward. Um, so I thought today um, I was going to touch a bit on a case study to kind of um, round out the conversation in terms of how we struggle with um, issues related to reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and then also take a step back um, to provide some context to that discussion. And this is a framework that um, I'm developing to kind of help that kind of conversation along. And it's basically, um, it, it comes from the idea that when we approach sustainability and housing um, to re really gain traction and have the conversations that are um, kind of authentically meaningful to our team and the client's team, um, it centers a sort of different set of questions than you might see in, a, in an ordinary green building framework. Uh, you can move forward. So this is Coliseum Place. It's under construction, about five months left. Um, in Oakland, California, 59 um, affordable family apartments um, and 20% for the unhoused. Go ahead. And this project was, um, it set off with a very ambitious aspirational goal of being a zero net energy, six story affordable housing project in Oakland. So I just wanted to use this case study to kind of talk about that journey. Um, and one of the first things to realize about a building like this is that a lot of the key loads that contribute to energy use and operational emissions um, are ones that are outside of the architect's sort of conventional control. The HVAC, the cooling, heating, in both residential and common areas really makes up, at least in this building, in our mild climate, less than 25% of the whole building use. Um, and so that's the envelope. That's all the systems we're putting into the envelope. The really big opportunity is the central hot water system. And then there's also looking at residential plug loads, the actual uh, energy associated with people living in their homes using appliances, plugging in their TVs, computers, et cetera. Go ahead. On that note, um, it's it's our position that um, we are actually not really worried too much about controlling those plug loads. And one reason is that some data um, from ZE multifamily projects has shown that in a large project, heavy users kind of outweigh the 
the low users. And so uh, this project met its ZNE goal, even though you can see many apartments far, far exceeding the black line, which is the kind of modeled, um, the modeled prediction there. Um, so on the hot water side, that's really kind of the, the big space, as, as some of you probably know, um, of innovation in the multifamily decarbonization world. So we are used to putting in big gas boilers um, that offset a portion of that energy use with solar thermal systems on the roof. So not photovoltaic panels, but solar hot water. Um, and we're really shifting that to heat pumps. This was a project that we, it became a, a pilot demonstration of an innovative central heat pump water heater that used a very low global warming potential refrigerant. Um, and this is what it looks like. Same tank in the central plant um, over the, on the right covered in foam, and then a bunch of kind of suitcase looking uh, condenser units that basically are responsible to heat the water in that tank. Go ahead. Another approach that we have explored is decentralizing the hot water altogether, either by putting the water heaters directly in units or by creating these little mini plants. And Coliseum Place was the project where we um, experimented with this approach. This is by far the cheapest overall water heating system uh, because of the, the amount of equipment um, is lowered because the units are shared. The downside is that you have these home runs to fixtures and so you're dealing with kind of wait times that you'd be expecting on like a larger single family home uh, for the hot water to get to your fixture. And so we're, we're looking at that. Um, I think in terms of overall emissions, the thing I wanted to hit home was that on this project, this is the life, this is an estimate of the lifetime of operational emissions over the next uh, like 20 years or so. So that near term, you know, 17 year horizon that Chelsea was talking about. Um, the yellow line would be a mixed fuel building because it's continually burning gas. And so that line keeps going up. The orange line is the all electric building with the um, hot water recirculation removed, which saved about 40% of that one load. Um, and that actually brought us into spitting distance of a zero net energy project. Um, the, the line is curved because it's taking into account that the grid is itself getting, getting cleaner. And so by 2040, if, if we believe the state goals, that line would level off. So I thought was, this was really interesting that these goals really drove the project. And I thought, well, I just am curious as a frame of reference, what is, how does this compare to some of the embodied carbon? So in the next slide, um, we didn't do an extensive life cycle analysis we didn't really have to get farther than the concrete. <laughs> uh, when we looked at the sort of achievable but aggressive cement replacement for that first layer of, of concrete, the first floor, it's five layers of wood over a podium, um, that reduction, you know, over a short time frames, you know, 10, 15 years, is very similar, same order of magnitude. Um, and that was really eye-opening because that is something that just takes education, coordination uh, more than big investment. Um, I did also do a sort of back of the envelope on, you know, what the benefit would be of uh, sourcing all of the wood framing as FSC. And I didn't show it because it, it's wrong. <laughs> but I was sad, I just anecdotally will share that I was satisfied that it was also, a sim it was less than the concrete impact, but a similar order of magnitude. So we are really interested in um, specking FSC lumber. We found it very hard. Uh, from an incremental cost to in, in this construction market to justify. There's a group, um, Affordable Housing Coalition, uh, sorry, could, uh, what do they call themselves? So it's basically a pilot cohort um, out of the International Living Future Institute that's really trying to hammer on sourcing FSC lumber. This slide um, takes another step back and just looks at operating emissions across our portfolio um, and um, Robin mentioned the 2030 commitment. So this is data that we've collected from our predicted energy use, but also actual for the buildings that we've been able to collect that from um, for reporting to the AIA to the 2030 challenge. And what this says to me um, is A, predicted en energy modeling um, 
we often have to use Title 24 reporting to report our projects and it's not very meaningful. It doesn't really meaningfully represent what a building will use. Um, it also hits home the importance of verification over technology. I think we're at a point in energy efficiency where we can really shift our focus from, from technology to, especially in multifamily building, commissioning, doing some basic um, oversight work during the construction process and monitoring after construction's completed to make sure that um, operations are meeting the design intent. The project called Edwina Benner down there is that central heat pump water heater pilot. And I think one of the reasons it's so dead on um, and successful is that that central heat pump uh, got a lot of attention and made sure that it was handed off to the client to operate perfectly. Um, so this is a really, um, a really important kind of step forward for us is collecting more actual energy use and letting that guide our practice. Uh, next slide. So, and here I kind of wanted to add some context to kind of bring it back full circle um, to Todd's introduction. Um, from my perspective, you know, we're really used to understanding the relationship between buildings and climate change along kind of four kind of major trajectories. We're really focused on reducing resources. Um, and our code of ethics as architects um, obligates us to focus on the impact of the building itself and, and what, what we're doing with our design choices. Um, if you go to the next slide, when you talk about housing and where that's intersecting climate change, there are real tangible ways that where and how we build also have really important implications for um, how we can mitigate and adapt to climate change. And so I wanted to just take the last few minutes to highlight a couple of those examples. Um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> One of them goes back to Coliseum Place and it's really this understanding that when you talk about um, energy, renewable energy on buildings, you're, you're really talking about, as a Z &E building in particular, is about adding energy infrastructure to the grid. Um, and what I think the, the conversation is helpful if it focuses on how that energy infrastructure benefits the building first, and how do we target um, removing barriers to maximizing the benefit to the, um, the owner. Um, this is a case where this large exuberant um, PV array would have actually been cheaper when you take into account um, federal tax credits and other ways of financing that PV using utility allowance um, adjustments. But because it was such a, con a large construction cost, it was almost a million dollars, even though that first cost would have been lower than the, than the smaller array, uh, cost containment limitations of, the, of a tax credit project as affordable housing limited the owner, it raised the risk of, um, of having the construction costs balloon out of control. And so they, they cut that back for those reasons, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> Next slide. Um, another aspect of this is when you talk about access to innovation, um, there's this whole infrastructure of electric vehicles that we need to have our eye on because that will quickly become an equity issue. Um, it's, it's currently understood as a luxury item, um, but if we don't build that infrastructure into housing now, a lot of people of low income especially will be blocked out of that transformation. Can go to the next one. And then it's just um, fighting environmental and social vulnerability. A lot of places we build um, are changing in use from industrial to residential areas, um, especially the, a lot of affordable housing uh, gets these sites that maybe aren't ideal from uh, other perspectives. And so we have to deal with um, really proactively counteracting some of the environmental vulnerabilities that the site is facing we can continue. And you can imagine, you know, if we don't do that, there are very real ways in which we're not solving the problem as the challenges of climate change get um, um, increase. Uh, so this is a really compelling graphic, I thought, that just shows the relationship between your vulnerability to overheating and your income level in Oakland. Go ahead to the next one. 
and similarly with smoke events, right? If people can't stay safe and healthy in their homes during a smoke event um, that we're having more frequently, you're in very real ways in, in impacting their health. And so again, back to that initial energy loads graph, if you focus so much on just reducing loads in the technology, um, you know, you might be, you really have to sort of uh, design your systems in particular with these considerations foremost. All right, next one. Um, another example of this too is especially again in affordable housing, um, the materials that we use um, tend to be sort of held at a lower standard in terms of the kinds of chemicals that we're exposing people to, especially the use of plastics um, uh, in, in these projects. So we're, I really love referring people to this particular framework that's focusing on chemicals that produce chronic acute harm in people. Okay, go ahead to the next one. And then lastly, I think this is like, again, like the, the furthest layer of the onion out from where we started. Um, but I, this is a really great eye opener for us on a project where we, we asked people, um, you know, if they have a computer in their home, they have access to internet. Um, and this was a, a low income community and it tracked exactly with this national data from the Pew Research Center that shows the disparity between people that have access to internet and imagine, especially during the pandemic, I think now we're understanding just how fundamental having access to broadband is. And it, you know, that's not something as architects we usually think about. Um, but imagine what kind of like, it's just sort of, to me, this is a great example of how housing really is this foundation. And without that foundation, we really weaken ourselves in the face of environmental change. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring it way out and, to, and close it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, Chelsea, and Robin for those um, really thoughtful comments and presentation. Um, we're gonna move right now into a quick Q&A with our panelists. And then if there are any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and Hack staff will help me uh, moderate those. Uh, so the first question is for Katie. Is it more expensive to incorporate sustainability into design? Oh uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, in some ways, there's a very clear answer. Well, yeah, there are certain things that cost more. Um, I've also seen a, a lot of things. People, a lot of things cost more, <laughs> and people will make decisions uh, based on what's important to them in the end. Um, we've we've seen that people um, decide to invest in in areas of the building where they've, you know, they have a personal experience with something. Uh, for instance, you know, um, flooded showers might result in really, um, really durable waterproofing of all the bathrooms, which would be a very expensive and non-standard thing. So I think it's, um, I think there is actually a lot of room for conversation. And even if something is expensive, it's not, it's no excuse for not having asking the questions and having the conversation up front. That example of discovering that the concrete, that the cement mix, um, you know, would have had a very similar impact to our electrification plans was something that the structural engineer just like got talking to us about, right? And without us sort of opening the door to that conversation, I'm not sure that would have happened, so. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question for all three of y'all. Are you hearing clients or community members asking for more sustainable features in your work? I think definitely. Um, I feel like, you know, I'm, people call me to ask questions about wood and sustainability is coming up more and more. So. Yeah, I think it, it I've seen that it definitely depends on the client. Certain clients are more um, aware and they care more about it. Other clients still just kind of care about the bottom line um, and that, you know, dollar amount. So I kind of think it needs to, it definitely needs to start from the clients and they need to be willing to put that investment in. We're seeing a lot of our clients find a lot of alignment with um, especially electrification and their own kind of financial look at the project. So even if that's a complex um, relationship, it's not on every project that going all electric will be 
cheaper, but in many cases it does have long-term benefits and sometimes it is cheaper. Um, and so we've had some clients who we would have expected to be more reluctant kind of go all in or come to us uh, requesting uh, to do something different in new. So. Thank you. Um, is there legislation or policy in the works around sustainable design from each of your purviews that you think our attendees should know about? Um, there is, Marin County actually has the first low carbon concrete code. Um, so in Marin, you're required to meet specific, uh, you know, re reducing your greenhouse gas emissions with environmental product declarations or um, minimum, like maximum cement allowances. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that with uh, Biden's announcement. You know, if we're going to cut our greenhouse gas emissions, there's going to need to be policies across the country in place for this. Yeah, there, there is a policy in place um, in the state of California. It's called Buy Clean. Um, it's specifically targeted towards structural steel, um, reinforcing steel, glass, and insulation to kind of put a limit on the global warming potential of those materials and their um, uh, production and manufacturing processes as well. Sorry, I think you got muted. Okay, I'm back. Um, so that's kind of one policy that has been put in place in California and with the Marin um, policy as well and Biden's. I agree with Chelsea that I think we can see more uh, legislation come into play uh, actually relating to sustainability and our built environment. The Carbon Leadership Forum is also tracking this. They have like a map that shows you all the carbon policy across the country. It's a great resource. Thanks for that. Um, oh, questions from the audience. Sorry, scrolling up. For Katie uh, from Lauren, we have what subsidies, incentives, et cetera, are you able to, able to take advantage of in building to build affordable housing, especially in mass timber, specifically at the state and federal level? Um, I don't know of any incentives in terms of mass timber. Um, at the at the state and national level, maybe maybe Chelsea has more insight on that than we do. But um, the the main kind of incentive programs that have that I think have sort of had the most impact are the affordable home sustainable communities. Um, it's a sort of a, a cap and trade fund for affordable housing, um, and that's really spurred a lot of electrification and in, uh, solar investments in solar and efficiency. Thank you. Chelsea, anything to add? Um, not really at this time. I think there's some things in the works, but I'm not aware of any currently. Okay. Great. Sorry. Um, another one for Katie. Did you hold up the distributed water heating as a beneficial system for energy use? Uh, if so, is the overall sustainability uh, level lessened by the wasting of water while waiting for the hot water to be delivered? Can you explain? go into a little more detail there? Yeah, it's a really great, great question. And I think it's confusing because I'm ambivalent as well. Um, I do think there's a trade-off. I am concerned about the water waste. I should have mentioned that we did design the system to meet water set standards. Um, and that includes some devices that help um, reduce that waste. Basically, the you pull a string and the, the flow will stop when the hot water arrives to the faucet. And so the, the water that you're wasting is that small volume that um, that is just getting cleared uh, while the hot water comes to the faucet. But I agree, I think um, it's I think it's an example of designing a system with, with a single goal, sort of a, a priority in mind. Um, and we'll we'll be interested to to see what the solution is, the outcome is. Yeah. Um, for Chelsea, you noted that a significant portion of the weight of trees upon harvesting is water, and that this weight contributes negatively to the generation of truck-related pollution. I'll pause there. <laughs> Are there efforts being pursued to have the trees dry in place before being transported that you know of? Yes, yeah, so I think Robin might have been the one who mentioned the water weight, but um, I do have an answer for this. So actually, the 
when we're speaking about mass timber, the mass timber manufacturers are located currently where the wood is sourced. So they're up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, that timber basket, and then there's some down in the South uh, East as well. So the mass timber manufacturers are where the wood is being sourced. So that's not going that far from where you're cutting the trees to where they're milling them to then the manufacturing facility. Um, none of the mass timber manufacturers are currently in California. So there is that transportation cost then that you'd think about for your uh, carbon emissions in terms of trucking things, or you know, sometimes they're sourcing them from Europe. So you have to think about the barge um, and comparing those transportation emissions is important. And hopefully uh, you know, there is efforts to bring mass timber manufacturing to California. So hopefully we'll see that soon. Thank you. Oh. Uh, from Dylan, has the rise in the price of timber affected any projects that you all are working on or Chelsea, any insight to that? What was the question? Sorry. Has the rise in the price of timber affected projects? Uh, yes, it has. Um, I think that I've talked to several manufacturers about this actually, and they're really doing their best to if the project's, you know, a few years out, you know, you don't have to put your deposit down on your wood fiber yet, you know, like there will be an end to this. Like right now there is a supply demand issue due to the pandemic and everyone doing more at home improvements. And, um, but there is going to be an end to this and manufacturers are really trying to work with clients to make sure that they don't have to buy the fiber at the current cost. So um, there are efforts being made for that. Thank you for that. And then I thought I saw a hand raised for Robin Lovett. If you still have a question, you can unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. Then I have one last question for all of you. Give Robin hey, a sec. Yeah. Could I, uh, am I on? This is yes. Robin Lovett. Yeah, hi. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so thanks a lot. The presentation is really interesting. And and um, Katie, I, I loved how you connected all the dots. It's, it's fantastic. I just wanted to, Mentioned it's a little off topic, but there were some comments with regard to, uh, I guess, driving in electric vehicles. And Chelsea, in the beginning of your presentation, you you referred to the way we drive as having an effect on the on uh, energy use and climate change. And then, uh, um, Katie, you mentioned something about electric vehicles. Um, I think there's a there's a misconception that electric vehicles are, <laughs> you know, the panacea. Um, you know, uh, it's not just about whether it's powered by uh, internal combustion or electricity, you know, cars take up. A, and I think, Katie, I don't have to preach to you at David Baker's office, but cars take up a lot of space. There's a lot of safety considerations, uh, the materials that go into them, and, and even things like tire dust that it doesn't matter whether it's powered by, you know, internal combustion or electric, um, so that have, you know, uh, very bad health effects. Um, and, and so I think a big part of the equation too is, is the location of projects and how they relate to our transportation system and what kind of transportation systems we have. And, um, you know, again, Katie, I don't have to tell, tell you working for David Baker that besides walking, you know, bicycling is the most energy efficient means of transportation I think there is. So I think that, pro, you know, people designing and building projects should take into consideration other modes of transportation other than driving. So I just want, wanted to put that out there that there were a couple of, of comments during the presentations that assumed that uh, electric vehicles were the, the way to go. Um, they're not the panacea that I think we all hope they would be. So that's uh, I completely point. agree. I guess I'll, I would just say that the, the difference is where they do exist. <laughs> Um, and especially serving um, low-income housing, um, it, it's just a it's just a miss to assume that that providing chargers is something that low-income people don't need or you know will never. That's all. But I agree, cars cars in general should uh, are not yeah we're not adding cars to save problem yeah to solve the problem. Yeah, and I appreciate that. That's something that Hack is always you know talking in the project reviews of like let's reduce 
parking. Like if you don't have parking, you can't have a car <laughs> and making sure that the projects are located in uh, transport areas, I think is key. So I think yeah. there's a lot of things that go into this solution. Great, thank you both. Um, we have time for one last question before I thank everyone for joining us. So really quickly, what are you most hopeful or excited about uh, as it relates to the future of sustainable buildings and homes? wants to tackle that first. I think I'll, I'll go first. Um, I mean, I'm really excited to see mass timber being used more in the multifamily application. I think currently we're seeing it being used in a lot of office spaces like Wondaharo and Google and Microsoft and tech campuses. But I think there is a really good and viable use for it in multifamily and not only using more sustainable products in multifamily, but also being able to expose that mass timber and take advantage of those biophilic benefits. I think that will be really um, exciting to see. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think it comes back to just general, it, not just mitigation, but adaptation. Um, that resilience has to sort of be the center when you're, when you're designing housing and when you're looking at, um, uh, for instance, load shifting and using more thermal storage and battery storage to help um, further reduce the emissions of building energy use, that the benefits of that, again, should, should fall first to the resilience of housing so that they stay active and safe um, uh, during any sort of disruptive events. I think there's a lot of alignment. Thank you. you know, it's, it's a hard thing to say here, but I, I, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of things I'm excited about, but I think I'm really excited to just have these conversations and to bring awareness to this and like all the different ways we need to think about um, a future of sustainability um, around policy, around new innovations and materials, around the ways we think about how we build and where we build and providing homes for people. I don't know. <laughs> Great. That's, that's perfect. A perfect way to end it. Uh, Chelsea, Katie, and Robin, thank you so much for having this conversation with us and for the thoughtfulness behind your presentation. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, a special thank you to Woodworks for sponsoring this conversation. Really, really delighted to have y'all active. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this conversation on Earth Day. As I said, we'll be sharing out the presentation um, when it's available and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Kayla. Thank you Bye. so much. Thanks everyone, bye.